Welcome to another eSwordTraining.com Bible study video, free on the YouTube channel. In this Bible study, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 29 and 11, one of the most popular verses used in motivational materials such as signage and pictures, as well as a verse that is often used by individuals that teach concepts related to success and wealth and prosperity. However, using the eSword Bible application, we're going to look at this verse fully in its context to understand what this verse is saying to us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, to begin understanding this verse, it's interesting to see it in another translation. Let's look at the English Standard Version. The ESV is downloadable from within eSword. So, when you go to Download and Bibles, you will see that ESV is one of those that can be downloaded. I've simply already downloaded it here. So, you can download the ESV Bible and have that as an alternate translation as well. eSword comes with the King James Version right out of the box. Now, here in the ESV, listen to Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Here's the key thing I want to show you where there's a difference. The word plans. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare and not for evil. When you go to the King James Version, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew words behind some of these things are key. First of all, a very famous Hebrew word is in this verse, shalom. You'll see if we go to the King James Version plus Strong's Numbers, and then you look at this word peace and click on it, go to your either Strong's Dictionary or if you've downloaded it, the Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary. Now, again, if you go to Download Dictionaries, you will notice right here is the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew Definitions. So, you might want to grab that so that you'll have it. I also recommend the King James Concordance. I'll look at that in this study as well. So, here we see this word peace, the word shalom, and you can see it means safe, happiness, friendliness, welfare. So, this is the word that is actually used for peace. Well, what about this word for thoughts? I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. So, if we look at that word, it is the Hebrew word for Strong's number 4284. It means a plan. So, it means a plan. Now, keep in mind everything after this colon in a Strong's definition is not definitional, but rather it's ways it was translated within the Bible. That's very important to keep in mind. When reading a Strong's definition, everything up to the colon is the definition. Everything after the colon is actually ways it's translated in the Bible. So, that's important to keep in mind. You can't just take all of these words after the colon and say, well, here, I want it to mean imagination or I want it to mean curious work. No, it means something in this context. And the meaning in general of the word is a contrivance that is concretely a texture, machine, or abstractly an intention or plan, whether bad, a plot, or good, advice, and so forth. Now, with this definition in mind, we can see that the ESV translation, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope, is a really good translation. You can also see with the King James Version, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. This last phrase, even though this is a saying in Hebrew that really does mean what the ESV says, a future and a hope, the saying tells you that the thoughts are thoughts of plans. So, if you want to use the word thoughts, if you want to use the word plan, either way, it's important to know that God is saying here, I know the way I'm thinking about your future. And the way I'm thinking about your future is thoughts of peace 
and not of evil, to give you an expected end, to give you hope for your future. This is what the Lord is saying. Now, let's take this and consider that word thoughts again. But this time, what I'm going to do is go to the King James Version plus Strong's Numbers, click on the Strong's Number for Thoughts, and go to the King James Concordance, which I pointed out in the downloads is available. I love this module in eSword. I think if you have eSword without using this module, you're missing a lot. Because what this does is it takes that Hebrew word, it tells me it's 55 times in the King James Version of the Old Testament, 27 times it's translated thoughts, eight times devices, four times device, three times cunning, three times imagination, three times purpose, three times purposes, one time curious, one time devised, one time means, and one time thought. So we can see the different ways in which it is actually translated in different places. And if we take a look at some of these, like let's say Psalm 9411, in the pop-up it says, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Here's a famous one, Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so here clearly the imagination of the thoughts of his hearts, the things man is coming up with, planning, right, are only evil continually. So we see that plan can be a very good translation of the word. All right, so that's an interesting concept. Now we can also look at this from another perspective, and that is that we can look at some of these different commentaries. So if we look at the pulpit commentary, which I have installed here, and go down to Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I knew the thoughts. Those seventy years must pass over you in exile, yet do not apprehend that I have forgotten you, for I know full well what my purpose is towards you, a purpose of restoring to you peace and prosperity, an expected end, rather a future and a hope, a hopeful future. There is a hope for thy future, is also stated in Jeremiah thirty-one seventeen. That unexpectant apathy, which is the terrible accompaniment of so much worldly sorrow, was not to be an ingredient in the lot of the Jews. In other words, this commentator is letting us know that, yes, you're in bondage, you're in exile for 70 years in Babylon, but know that I have a future planned for you. Now, where does the 70 years come from? It comes from actually verse 10. So Jeremiah 29, 10 says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. In other words, this hopeful future that we're talking about is 70 years down the road. And the comfort is, God says in verse 11, I have plans, I know what I'm doing. This is for peace and not for evil to give you a hopeful future. Another commentary here is E.W. Bullinger. He lets us know that the phrase an expected end is a figure of speech. An end and an expectation, an end, yea, an end which I have caused you to hope for. For example, a hoped for end. So it's saying that's a figure of speech in Hebrew, and that's why the ESV translates it to give you a future and a hope. Now we have another commentary here, and that is the Cambridge Bible. It says, For I know an assurance on Jehovah's part that he forgets them not, even though they be far from their proper land, the thoughts that I think, my purposes, hope in your latter end a latter end, and a hope. So very simple. But here's the one I like the best. It really stood out to me when I was looking at this. Here for Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14 is what this commentary is. This is the Sermon Bible. This is a module that is downloadable from alternate download sites. In our training at eSwordTraining.com, we teach you not only how to install the modules that come from eSword.net, but also the modules that are available from third-party websites. And there are literally hundreds that you can add on to your eSword installation. Notice here it says, We may describe every real affliction that comes upon the Christian as a captivity, to be in a condition which we should never voluntarily have preferred, or to be held back by the power of something which we cannot control, from that which we eagerly desire to do. Is not that the very thing in an experience which makes it a trial? This is the case with bodily illness with business perplexities, sometimes even with providential duties. Every captivity of which the Christian is the victim will have an end. In the fatherland above, meaning heaven, we shall work without weariness and serve God without imperfection. So in the prospect of that home, 
we may well be reconciled for a season to the discomforts of our present exile. So this is the first thing. Then it goes on. But while there is much in this view of the case to sustain us, we must not lose sight of the moral end which God has in view in sending us into our captivity. Of course, they mean our illnesses, our business perplexities, or any other suffering we face. He sees the result from the beginning, and all the afflictions which he sends are but like the hammer strokes of the sculptor, each of which removes some imperfection or brings some new loveliness to view. How many of our idolatries he has rebuked and rectified by our captivities? How many portions of his word have been explained to us by our trials? How many of us might say with truth that we had never really prayed till God sent us into captivity? And then he summarizes. If we would have such results from our captivity, our suffering, there are certain important things which we must cultivate. I suggest, or I mention, one, a willing acceptance of God's discipline and patient submission to it, two, unswerving confidence in God, and three, fervent prayer. This comes from Taylor, the Christian at Work, June 20th, 1878. This is a phenomenal summary of this passage. It's one of the best I've ever seen. Because here's the thing, in context, and context is so important, when I suggest thinking about context, you look at it at least at three levels. Under what covenant is this, old or new? What kind of book is this, historical, poetry, prophetic, a gospel or history of a special type for gospels, a letter? The point is, what kind of book is it? And then what book is it? Because that tells you who it's written to and what the general context of that book is. So when we take that, we say, okay, we're in the Old Covenant, we're in the prophets, and we're in the book of Jeremiah, which is written to Israel. So in the absolute context, the hard context of this verse, we're talking about Israel here. The Lord is promising Israel. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, Israel, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you, Israel, an expected end, a hopeful future. However, this also tells us about God. We see God's character in this verse. And when we see God's character, what we see is that when we're in our suffering and we think he has abandoned us, it is actually then that his attention is most upon us. It is actually in those times that he is looking at us, understanding our situation, but more than understanding our situation, helping to make us what he wants us to be. We can never begin to fathom the great accomplishment that God wants to have in our lives because we are simply too finite, but we can trust in Him, have a willing acceptance of God's discipline and patient submission to it with unswerving confidence in God and fervent prayer. If we take that approach, we can be hopeful that we have this hopeful expected end, that God's action, or as we may see it in action, is of peace and not of evil that we are in his thoughts. So no, this verse is not saying, hey, I've got good news for you. Let me take the ESV out of context and tell you I've got plans for welfare and not for evil. And some even like translations that might say wealth or prosperity to give you a future hope. Yes, absolutely. Welfare, wealth, prosperity, whatever you want to call it, shalom. But his plan is for positiveness. Okay, that's the way we can say it and not for evil, giving us a future hope, but not so we'll be millionaires, not so we'll have private jets, not so that we will live in massive mansions. No. So we will be better because we are in the place that God wants us to be. See, that was the ultimate goal of this passage, wasn't it? To take them back to this place. We see that in verse 10. So, when we look at Jeremiah 29, 11, we consider some of the Hebrew and look at different translations and also take advantage of the commentaries available in Esword, we can see it is a very motivational verse. But it's not motivational about, hey, we can become rich and prosperous. It's motivational because, hey, even though we might be in affliction right now, we know we're in God's thoughts and in God's plans. And his plans are for our welfare or peace, and not for evil. And he wants to give us an expected end, meaning an end we're looking forward to that we're hoping for. I hope this study using the ESORT application has been beneficial to you. 
and I look forward to being with you next time we study a verse together.